Good morning. Uh, today is an exciting day in Washington because we get to introduce to Washington our uh, incoming Secretary of Health, Dr. Amir Shah, who will be taking the reins from John uh, Wiesman on December 21st. And I'm very excited about this announcement. Dr. Shaw has led the Harris County Public Health Department in Houston, Texas, for the last seven years with great uh, esteem. Uh, that is a significant group that represents 4.7 million residents. Uh, before working for that health district, he worked as an emergency department physician and as the chief medical officer for Galveston Health District. He's led Harris County through quite a number of emergencies and challenges, including preparation and responses to the, to the novel H1N1 outbreak, uh, COVID-19, uh, Zika and Ebola viruses. And he's really a nationally recognized leader. And in fact, you may have seen him on CNN this morning uh, talking about COVID vaccines. He's a person that the nation has looked to for advice about local uh, health leadership for, for years now. So he really is respected in the public health community. I've enjoyed getting to know him already. And so the, his willingness to come to Washington to help our state is something um, I'm greatly appreciative of. He's also an immigrant. He was born in Pakistan and raised in Ohio. And he has an informed appreciation uh, for equity issues, which we are particularly appreciative of now. And as uh, particularly regarding the disparity in, in outcomes in this particular pandemic. So I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Shaw and hope that uh, he will uh, uh, make some comments today. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Governor. Can you hear me? You bet. You sound great. T take it away. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Shaw, you sound great. Well, great. I'm in, I'm in uh, Texas, as you can imagine, so I want to make sure the sound uh, is, is, is traveling all the way across to the Pacific Northwest. Um, I want to thank you, Governor. It is an absolute honor and privilege and thrill to be joining your team as the next Secretary of Health. I am uh, honored that you have selected me. I will also say that it is an honor to follow in the footsteps of Dr. John Wiesman, who has been a friend, a colleague, and an incredible health leader, uh, not just at the state level in Department of Health, but also at the local level in the state of Washington. And, you know, I, I, I have to say that it's a, it's a bittersweet day for me because I'm leaving behind so many incredible, incredible family and friends and staff members who have just done such an amazing job in fighting for public health in our community. Uh, as well as our county leadership led by Judge Lena Hidalgo and our county commissioners. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank all of them for all their support all these years. I am also equally honored and privileged to be joining you and your vision of health. Uh, I know your focus on obviously right now is COVID-19, but well beyond COVID-19, everything else that is happening in the state of Washington related to health equity, related to issues in the environment, related to healthcare access, and certainly so many other ways of really making sure that we're ensuring the health and well-being of all Washingtonians. Um, it's a great honor, it's a, it's a great, uh, it's great uh, opportunity, but it's also going to require some transition, uh, and it will require me to, although I have family and friends in the, in the Washington area, um, it is also gonna require a transition for my family uh, my wife, our, our three kids, our newest puppy uh, uh, who has joined our family, and uh, we are just absolutely thrilled. Um, I will say the other thing, Governor, is that I, I, as you mentioned, I'm a strong proponent of public health and uh, the importance of prevention, the importance of uh, government working together at the federal, state, and local levels, and I'm also because I've been at the local public health level for so many years, I'm very much wanting to bring those relationships and those ability to bring people together uh, to the state of Washington. Um, innovation, engagement, equity, global health, um, health tech, all of these things are absolutely critical. But right now, the most important focus for everyone is fighting COVID-19. And I just really look forward to bringing my experience, my passion, 
and my dedication to you, to the team, and to the state of Washington on behalf of all Washingtonians. Thank you. Dr. Shaw, thank you. Thanks for uh, coming to our state. I know your children are going to enjoy the great outdoors here, and I look forward to showing them some good hiking trails. Uh, and, and this is a catch for the state of Washington, uh, Dr. Shaw, given your national leadership and leading the National Organization of Health Directors. So thank you for your willingness to be here. And you have given us great confidence as we have this very important handoff right now, given the pandemic that we're up against. But listen, I got to tell you, we're going to miss John Wiesman. Um, his work during this pandemic has been uh, just exceptional. And I think it's shown success. As you know, uh, we have kept the pandemic infection rates below probably 40 or 45 other states. And that's in large part because of John's consistent leadership. But last February, he announced he was going to take a position in North Carolina, his alma mater at the Gillings School of Public Health. He was going to do that in 2021. He told us that essentially before we knew how bad this was going to be. And the fact that he has stayed with us throughout this, I just really appreciate but I want to appreciate his work before COVID as well. He has been such a visionary leader, uh, helping us uh, work with tribal communities, uh, passing the 21-year-old age limit for tobacco and vapor products. And he's been an unwavering advocate for bringing more equity to our healthcare system. So I'm really going to miss you, miss you John. But you're still in service, so uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning first thing. We have a few more updates today. Uh, most of the new restrictions we announced Sunday have now taken effect, with the exception of the dining establishments, where today is the last day of indoor seating for at least the next four weeks. Uh, we do know that uh, uh, this is a very difficult decision to make, uh, given the fact that our restaurant owners have worked so hard to uh, decrease risk in their establishments. We've really appreciated that. But we know that restaurants are uh, the number one non-health care setting for COVID outbreaks in our state. And the science tells us that in any situation where two people sit across the table from one another or next to one another without masks, it's just a risky environment. And there's nothing that we can do to ameliorate that because people have to take their mask off when they eat. So um, all of our updated health guidance for businesses is now on the governor's office website. I want to thank my staff for working around the clock on this to help the people of the state uh, of Washington. I want to add, I mentioned that uh, we have already committed uh, $50 million to help small businesses, including restaurants, uh, through these difficult uh, weeks. We hope to have a more uh, clarity on how that will be administered uh, uh, either Thursday or Friday this week. And we're trying to do that as rapidly as possible, uh, given the stresses uh, on these business uh, people and their employees. So we'll have more to say in the next few days about those efforts. Uh, we know this is a statewide problem. Uh, I, we have a graph up uh, before you showing that essentially we have very active infections across the state of, of Washington. And we know we have to respond to it. Uh, inaction is not a solution. And we know that we are now in an explosive growth of this pandemic. Uh, this uh, graph shows you, uh, as a date of illness onset, what we've been facing. And what we've seen is just, uh, you know, almost a vertical curve of the acceleration of the infection in the last several weeks. Uh, I was looking at the numbers just through maybe two and a half, three weeks ago, we were looking at uh, daily numbers of maybe 600 infections, but this morning was about 2,700 infections. So in about three weeks, we've gone from the neighborhood of 600 on a daily basis uh, to the 2,000 plus range in the last week. Uh, this is an explosion that is taking place in the state of Washington. By the way, in this graph, if I can explain it to you, the red uh, the red marks are the places where we have not accumulated the, the full data. But when that is accumulated, each one of those bars will be higher. So this is even the optimistic way of looking at this. And you can see how rapidly uh, this pandemic is hitting us. We just cannot ignore that fact. It is a scientific reality that if things do not change, uh, this number will continue to skyrocket on the same pace or even an accelerated pace of the increased infections that we are experiencing. 
Now, we're also experiencing a, um, a problem in our hospitals. Uh, I just wanted to show you a graph that shows the, uh, the uh, hospital occupancy rising in eastern and western Washington. On the left in the green line is the hospital uh, COVID uh, uh, occupancy numbers in western Washington. On the right side in the red line is the occupancy in our hospitals uh, in eastern Washington. You'll see that they're going very, very rapidly just in the last couple of weeks. And of course, this is of great concern to us because uh, what we're seeing is a, is a foretaste of eventually ending up in the next several weeks of, of the places like El Paso, Texas, like Wisconsin, that are facing enormous emergencies of not being able to, to serve their patients in a meaningful way. So uh, uh, the things that are driving these recent decisions are our concern for 7.6 million Washingtonians and the scientific evidence, some of which I just alluded to. So we're concerned about every corner of our state right now. And uh, this is not just the graphical evidence. Uh, we get a, a briefing every Friday from the Institute for Disease Modeling, and they have confirmed uh, basically the information I just shared with you. We are in an explosive position on this pandemic at the moment. I just want to note, too, that uh, everyone has a stake in this pandemic. Even if you thought you were totally immune from COVID, and the reason is, is if you have an underlying health condition, or even if you don't, and you need just routine care, you may not be able to get it in a timely fashion in a few weeks because of our, house, our hospitals being choked with COVID patients. So our medical system is very much under stress. And uh, even if you today are in perfect health and you might have something come up, it may be difficult for you to get health care. And if you have underlying concerns, uh, if you got cardiac issues or cancer or have an upcoming surgery schedule, the stress of this pandemic could impact that because at some point hospitals will have to diminish what they can do for uh, other uh, procedures, uh, which include things that may not sound elective to us, cardiac procedures, even some cancer treatment, certainly orthopedic surgeon. Uh, if you're in a car accident and you want to get rushed to an ICU and the ICUs are full, that becomes an issue. So everyone at every age and every part in the state has a stake in this controversy. And I do want, I'm going to ask Kathy Lofi to talk about this too, but I heard somebody the other day say that, well, this is just an old people's problem. Well, that's just wrong. Middle-aged, young people, we've lost 19-year-old star athletes, uh, people in middle age across the state of Washington. Uh, and she will talk about the, the fact that this is, hits us all throughout all age groups. Uh, just a note on how we've made these decisions, and they have been very difficult. These decisions are not decided in a vacuum. We've brought many stakeholders in from the public, particularly in talking to the representatives of the industries that have been affected. We've learned a lot both from our medical and our business community, as well as from local elected officials. And this is reflected in the fact that these new restrictions are not as broad as they were in the spring. They're significantly different because we have found ways to do another, a number of things more safely when we adhere to health guidance. So this is a much less restrictive uh, rule than, than we used in March. And I want to thank the many partners we've talked to in helping us think through and target these restrictions in a way that makes sense. But we still need more partners in this. And that partnership, in some degree, extends to all Washingtonians uh, because there's uh, many things we can do individually that are so important. One of the things we can do is to stick to our old shopping habits. This is not a moment to be hoarding. It is not necessary. Our supply chains are very, very healthy. There have been some reports of hoarding. And uh, it's just not necessary right now because the supply chain is very healthy. It's going to continue to, to provide what we need. And uh, if people rush into these stores and jam the stores, it also creates uh, less healthy conditions. So buy what you need. It's going to be there next time you go shopping. Just keep shopping the way you normally uh, have done. 
Um, now, you can also, uh, you know, shop off peak hours, try contactless shopping where you order ahead and pick up your groceries at the curb. That's a great thing to do. Uh, but don't let, uh, don't let the fact that this pandemic is going uh, uh, turn this into a hoarding situation. Uh, we're a little more than a week away from Thanksgiving. And um, I know that this is a, such a crucial moment in our, in our yearly calendar. It is for my family. And so uh, this is going to be some tough decisions about Thanksgiving this year, but there are some decisions that need to be made. So if you are planning for people, however you're planning, whether it's closest friends or relatives, I hope you'll have a conversation with your family and your relatives about how dangerous uh, gatherings can be in people's homes today. There is simply no way to have uh, a dinner across people across the table not wearing masks and to make it safe right now with people who are not in our households. This is just a scientific fact. And so we have, uh, we have basically called for Washingtonians to celebrate Thanksgiving this year in a safe way so that we can do it what you might call our old fashioned way next Thanksgiving and not have empty chairs at the table next Thanksgiving. So whatever you're doing this Thanksgiving, I hope you will give thought to this. We basically have passed a rule that we can't have people outside of our households at this moment for Thanksgivings or parties or coffee clutches. Those things are just too dangerous right now. And this is a big deal. And the reason it's a big deal is that uh, the science suggests very strongly that that the majority of the new transmissions are taking place in our homes. And this is hard for us to grapple with because our homes seem so secure, they seem so safe. And if you're thinking about having your good friends over for Thanksgiving dinner, people you've known for 50, 60 years, who are wonderful people, what we know is, you know, unless they've been tested within seven days, they don't know whether they're positive. Unless we've been tested, we don't know if we're positive and we can infect our best friends, even though we love them and our relatives. So how you choose to celebrate Thanksgiving this year is going to have a huge impact on not only the course of this disease, but how we respond to it. Look, we have to get these numbers down. We cannot allow this continue to be a, an explosion of this pandemic. And the more people this year who are careful this Thanksgiving are not only going to save lives, but they're also going to hopefully prevent more dramatic action that would be necessary if, if frankly, if, if we don't uh, get this thing knocked down in the next several weeks. So I'm very hopeful that you can have conversations with your family and friends about this. Um, so to talk about some of the health issues uh, that I've alluded to, I, I've asked Dr. Lofi to make some comments about our thinking in this regard. Dr. Lofi. Great. Well, thank you, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Um, I do think it's really important for people to understand that this COVID-19 surge that we're experiencing right now is really something that we all need to be concerned about. It's not just a problem for old, that older people need to worry about. Um, throughout this pandemic, 44% uh, of people who have been hospitalized for COVID-19 here in Washington have been people under 60 years old. Um, so we know that people of all ages can get really sick um, from this infection. Um, in addition, um, as, the gov as the governor touched on, we all need and expect to receive great health care in Washington state when we need it. And um, as he sort of alluded to, like anyone could get in a car accident tomorrow or get diagnosed with cancer next week. Um, and if this happens, you may need to be in an intensive care unit or you may need to have a surgery. Um, currently, our ICUs in our medium-sized and larger-sized hospitals are quite full, um, many with occupancy rates over 80%. We have some ICU, we have additional ICUs in smaller hospitals, but those smaller hospitals don't generally have all the subspecialty care um, that's needed for people who are really, really sick. Um, our, we also heard this week that our hospitals are starting to delay procedures um, that aren't urgent. 
Um, and what, you know, may seem like, a, you know, when the hospital looks at all of the surgeries they have to do, some may look a little less urgent to others, but to you, if you're waiting for the surgery, it's usually urgent. Um, and we don't like to delay any procedures that have to be done. So um, if the COVID-19 surge continues, I, I think people really just need to understand that we may not have access to all the services our hospitals can provide to us now. Um, and this is not where we wanna be. Um, so now is the time um, to really take action um, and uh, for everybody to do everything they can um, to prevent getting sick. Um, it's really important, as the governor mentioned, uh, to make sure, and I'll just reiterate some of the messages, really important that people continue to wear their facial coverings, um, you know, whenever they are out around people outside of their household, maintain your physical distance, um, and, uh, you know, really keep, uh, you know, all of your interactions with people outside of your household outside. And with that, Governor, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Thanks for... Thanks for your amazing work. Uh, your team uh, work with Dr. Wiesman has just been so invaluable. I just want to make one comment about the timing of this decision. I, I've been asked the last couple of days about, you know, why now? Uh, you know, why not wait until things are more clear about uh, our situation? Why, why do this before our hospitals are jammed up? And the reason is, is it, it's sort of like, you know, you're, you're standing on the railroad tracks you know, why do you get off the tracks when you hear the whistle coming? There, there's a train coming our way, and, and we're on the tracks. And this is just a clear reality, and we've got we've to get out, out of that danger zone. And it's just too late if we wait. I think you're going to find uh, eventually you've seen some states that have been, uh, unfortunately, late, uh, late to this uh, game. They have waited months sometimes while they've allowed their states to be overrun by this this virus and now they're finally starting to suggest people wear masks and while that has happened thousands of people have died and and we just can't wait that long we, we got to get ahead of this curve if we're going to save lives in, in meaningful proportion so that's the reason for our decision it's more difficult because we haven't seen the horrendous overrunning of hospitals that other states are seeing, but we know it's coming to our state. So that's why I hope in Thanksgiving, people want to give thanks for the ability to have their loved ones with them at their dinner table outside of their household next Thanksgiving and pledge themselves to show the love for their families, to want them to be there next Thanksgiving. And the way to make sure that's the case is to find a new way to celebrate Thanksgiving this year. And I hope folks will do that. With that, happy to stand for questions. First question comes from Rachel with AP. Hi, for Dr. Lofi or Secretary Wiesman, can you speak specifically to the challenges health officials are facing with contact tracing as these cases continue to rise? And what's being done to try to improve that process? Sure, I'll start and uh, Kathy can join in. Um, of course, it's uh, challenging as these cases rise. Um, our uh, surge uh, capacity is being increased and we are uh, doing our best to uh, contact all of these cases. Uh, and, uh, you know, our approach to doing that is both a local and statewide approach. Um, what we really need is the public's health uh, help to actually implement these prevention measures, as I said, uh, so that we don't have to do as many of these case and contact investigations. Um, uh, we're asking people when they go get tested, for example, uh, to stay home until you get your test results. Don't come in contact with other people um, and make sure that you're you know, quarantining and isolating yourself. Um, and uh, as we get these uh, case and contact investigations, you know, we're going through them as quickly as we can, trying to get the critical information uh, to move forward. So we really, all of us need the public's help. The hospitals need your help. The public health people need your help. Your families need your help right now. If I just add something, uh, we want to thank the local communities that are helping on this. This is a, the contact tracing is a combination of local in state uh, resources, uh, Dow Constantine, the uh, day before yesterday, said they're adding 40 contact tracers in King County. We're appreciative of that. We'll continue to ramp up that capacity. 
but if I can allude to one of the problems is people don't answer the phone or text messages. We need cooperation from the public, and we need more cooperation. I've talked to some contact tracers that, you know, we're just not able to contact people. They won't respond. So we need the public's help on this. Rachel, would you like to ask a follow-up? Yeah, for Dr. Shaw, is there any particular area of our state response that you think needs to be changed or modified modified upon your arrival? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for that question. You know, at this point, what I would say is I'm, I'm very impressed by Governor Inslee and um, Secretary Wiesman uh, Dr. Lofi and the entire team that are at the state level, and, and I, I should underscore it's not just at the state level, but working with partners at the local level. Um, I, you know, it, it, it's hard to, to say right off the bat because things have uh, really gone well, uh, but there are challenges throughout the pandemic for everyone, not just in, you know, in a particular community, a particular state, or a particular country. This is a global phenomenon. And unfortunately, we're all dealing with things and there's always things that you can do better. Uh, there are always things that we can impress upon. And I think the most important thing is really just assuring that Washingtonians are working together as a community of like-minded people to come together to fight this pandemic. This should not be a, a political football. Uh, this should be really all of us together and, and the, the enemy is the virus and we have to do all that. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more detail about all the different areas that uh, governor and secretary and all the teams have been working on. Uh, but I will tell you that I've been impressed by the, the incredible assertiveness and the responsiveness that Governor Inslee and the team have, have really put forth as it comes to fighting this pandemic, not just today, but for months and months on end. So. Uh, that's actually part of the reason, one of the reasons that I did accept this position is because of that leadership. Next question comes from Joe with the Seattle Times. Dr. Shaw, given how much people have learned about the, the virus and its response uh, sort of on the fly as it's come, what are some things in Harris County that you, that you learned and, and readjusted uh, during the, the course of the pandemic down there? Oh my gosh, you know, there's so much. Uh, this is, uh, there is no playbook for this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a novel virus. Uh, once in a century, we have learned so much. I will say that we fought successfully the first couple of waves, the March, April, and again in, in June, July. And, you know, we've seen an uptick uh, here locally. It's not been as bad as other parts of Texas or other parts of the country. But I will tell you that, you know, it, it is, it is um, you know, one of those, Really, what what I've continued to say is uh, don't uh, don't say that everything is fine because you just don't know. This is one of those super slick viruses that when you just take your eye off the ball uh, very quickly, it can take hold of a community. I think one of the biggest things that I would say is the real importance of working with state leaders, state and local leaders working together. This is elected officials and all uh, other. Uh, aspects of community members, but also health officials. We all have to be on the same page. Uh, you know, whenever you have any uh, inconsistencies, whether it's at a global or a federal, national or a state or a local level, I don't really care what level of government it's at. Uh, it causes an incredible amount of confusion and complacency at the individual community member level. And then people tend to take risks um, um, with their health. And when they do that, unfortunately, that's when people and communities get in trouble. So what we've learned in our community is that we are, we're all in this together and we have to work together. And that means public health, that means healthcare, that means all of community approach. And finally, uh, we've learned is that we have to invest in health. And that means it's not just uh, during a pandemic, and we're learning a lot about things that we have to do, uh, but it's also well after and well in advance of the next pandemic or the next emergency that comes our way, because they un, uh, definitely will be uh, lurking around the corner. So it's just incumbent on all of us to just continue to champion the importance of health and not just uh, any one aspect of, of all the work that we do. So it's, it's all of us in this together. 
Bill, would you like to ask a follow-up? Yes, from the governor. Given how uh, much cases are rising, uh, both here and around the nation, it seems like certainly an open question of whether restrictions would be relaxed in mid-December. And, of course, Congress is not likely to act on uh, any federal um, relief soon. Why not call the legislature into a special session this month and um, set up some mechanisms for quickly providing relief for workers uh, and businesses over what uh, could be a very difficult couple months here? Well, I, certainly we can do that if we have, uh, A, a necessity of doing that, and B, an ability to do that. And I will continue to listen to legislators' ideas about that. The difficulty they have and we have at the moment is the persistent uh, lack of action from the federal government. And uh, uh, we are continuing hopeful that they will act to extend unemployment compensation. They simply have to do that. They have to give us additional resources to help these businesses that have been infected, restaurants and gyms and many, many others. This is just a national necessity. And there really is no excuse for, for uh, the federal government not to respond to this. So we remain hopeful that with the election of a new president, and uh, the emergence so that we now are in a third national wave that the federal government will act. Now, we're not sure of that. So at the moment, we don't have clarity about whether we'll have federal action or not. And it makes it more difficult for the legislators to say, yes, we're going to do X, Y, or Z, still having uncertainty whether the federal government's going to act. What I believe it is most likely is that in January, we will have a much better assessment whether federal government is going to act or not. And then in January, make the appropriate decisions in a very rapid pace to find out what we can or should do. And we will be able to do that. But I am talking to legislators. I'm listening to their ideas. Uh, at the moment, there isn't a consensus in the legislature about what could happen or should happen even before January, again, because of this hope that I believe is actually realistic that the federal government will act in January. Uh, now, there, I have heard some comments um, by some in the Republican Party that we should do something right now and just use the rainy day fund to solve the problem. But the problem is uh, we already have a multi-billion dollar budget, even if we use all of the rainy day fund just to keep the wheels on the truck for the state government. So that really is not a solution about where we would get uh, dollars to do another major uh, program. Now, as I've said, uh, we are committing $50 million. I hope to have more description of that program uh, later this week. So there would have to be major decisions, uh, either on the cutting or revenue side, to free up some additional funds for additional uh, business or employee relief, because we're going to use that rainy day fund just to keep our mental health system working, just to keep our schools funded. That's going to be drained, uh, given the multi-billion dollar hole in our budget already. So I guess in answer to your question, number one, it will be a very challenging uh, effort by our state if we have to do that. And B, we don't really know whether we have to do it this moment, because I think there is a reasonable chance. And I have an expectation that Congress will act in January. Next question comes from Keith with Como. Uh, uh, Governor, I know that uh, Secretary Wiesman made the decision to go to Chapel Hill in February, but we are in the middle of a war. Why are you changing generals in the middle of a war? Well, the general decided a long time ago <laughs> to make a change, and I respect people's ability to whatever reason. I'm not making the change. Uh, I would like to keep John for the next 100 years. He did an exceptional job, but obviously I respect his decision making. He made it a long time ago, and um, I, I can't, I can't contest his decision in that regard. I, and he, the work he has done has just been fantastic. And I'm serious about this. Look, in the middle of a pandemic, it's hard to recognize this, but what we have achieved under his leadership and Dr. Lofi's leadership, and I've had a role in it is quite extraordinary. Look, we had 45 other states in late October that had more infection rate than we did. To be in the top five when we were the first state to get hit, first state to get hit and have and be in the top five of keeping this under control is an extraordinary achievement. 
And it has not happened by accident or just luck. It's because we've made some good decisions, and John has been principally responsible for that. But also Washingtonians have heeded our scientific advice of wearing masks, socially distancing, and because Washingtonians have done that, we've had great success, and I believe we can continue to do that. So uh, I wish him well. He's had an incredible run here. And, I'm, and, and listen, uh, I can't overstate how lucky we are to have Dr. Shaw, to have a nationally recognized health expert willing to come to Washington State is, is, is just a remarkable thing. Governor, if I might add, this is uh, John, just, uh, you know, my commitment too has been to make sure we have this amazing transition to an amazing new leader. And uh, Dr. Shaw is that person. I have known him for a decade. We have worked closely together. Um, he is knowledgeable, compassionate, um, energetic, thoughtful, and I think just in what you have seen him engage uh, just in the first few minutes here, you can see he's an amazing leader. Um, and that was one of the advantages of my giving sort of advance notice that we could do this really well, even in a time of a pandemic. And we have a strong team um, at the Department of Health that Dr. Shaw is going to come in and help lead. And I will see to it that uh, the transition goes smoothly. So I couldn't be more thrilled uh, than to have Dr. Shaw lead um, the department. He is, he meets the exact profile that I talked to the governor's team about in terms of what I thought we needed in a new leader and somebody who, as you can see, is gonna hit the ground running. Keith, would you like to ask a follow-up? Uh, yeah, for Dr. Shaw, um, you come from a heavily populated county, but uh, state of Washington, 7 million people, extremely diverse. Uh, you've got populated areas, you've got uh, rural areas, and not everybody is buying into what the governor and Secretary Wiesman have been talking about as far as masking up and staying socially distant. There was a huge wedding, a super spreader event in eastern Washington. How are you going to handle such a, a large diverse state? Well, but thank you for that question. And, you know, I, I, I guess the, the, the pause that I would give in, in, the, in your, your question is that we are, I'm actually coming from a very diverse community. Um, we have 5 million people uh, in Harris County. Uh, it's larger than 20 some states. Uh, it is, um, uh, by population, it's geographically larger than Rhode Island and under the state of Delaware. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty big. And it's uh, not just that we're geographically large, we're incredibly diverse. There is no majority population in our community. We are frank urban, we're also suburban, we're also rural. And we have also been challenged by very, very much uh, very similar uh, kinds of um, uh, ways of, if you will, approaching COVID-19. Uh, some who have said, it should be this way. Some who have said it should be that way. And uh, the governor and I spoke about this, that, you know, all the decisions that are made are very difficult during this pandemic because there are trade-offs to all of those decisions. And yet we have to make those difficult decisions. I will tell you that our county elected official, uh, Judge Lena Hidalgo, our county leadership, and also the mayor of the city of Houston uh, have, have all work together to bring that diversity towards really an approach to, um, to, to health. And one, again, to focus back on the state of Washington is that I recognize that there's a diversity of, of thought and opinions, uh, but at the end of the day, we have to let science and evidence guide us. And ultimately, um, you know, if I, if I have a patient who uh, has a, um, uh, is taking blood pressure medication, I can say, hey, you know what? Uh, take your blood pressure medication. It's actually good for you. It's going to it's gonna reduce your risk for complications. Uh, that's not been politicized. My, my patient will take the medicine. But something as simple as, as wearing a mask uh, has become politicized. So I think it's about not about any one community or any one state. It's about all of us as Americans really working towards how do we address a pandemic that's once in a century. And I do agree with uh, Governor Inslee. I, I wish we could keep Dr. Wiesman for another 100 years because that would be the next uh, pandemic we get a <laughs> century from now. And so it'd be fantastic to have him. Um, and, and I recognize that, that you know, following 
um, in, in the footsteps of, of someone like John is, is incredibly challenging. Uh, but I did want to make one other comment, Governor, if it's okay, which is there is never a good time to transition. There is never a good time to transition. I'm, it's been a lot, the last 12, 24 hours for me has been very difficult. A lot of tears that have been shed. There is never a good time to transition. Um, a lot of things are happening during this pandemic. We just have to make sure we are leaving teams behind that are strong, they're capable, they're ready. And while the Johns of the world or the Omers of the world move on and move in different directions, that work continues, that mission continues, whether it's in Harris County or in Texas, or whether it's across the state of Washington. So I'm looking forward to joining governor and, and making sure that you know I can do whatever I can, but it's not about me, it's about the we, it's about all of us working together. Next question comes from Jim with the spokesman review. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shaw, I, I wonder if you could compare Washington's response to COVID-19 to what you've seen in, in Houston and Texas. And is there anything that that uh, Washington has done that you wish that you had done in, in Houston or, or vice versa, anything that you've done in Houston that you think Washington might have considered? You know, well, let me leave it at a very high level. I would say that, uh, for example, Sunday when Governor Inslee announced uh, the uh, the changes in, in how, uh, you know, with indoor dining and, and other, um, other um, activities, uh, he talked about one thing, which I would, I, my, I'm, I'm very much about metaphors. You'll learn that. Sometimes I mix them. Sometimes they're not the right metaphor, but I do my best to continue with metaphors. It's a rubber band. And if the healthcare system and the system stretches, eventually it breaks. So we've got to do everything we can not to stretch the system. And um, in Texas, one of the challenges we've had is is about masks and about, you know, uh, fortunately, um, our governor here eventually came to the conclusion that we do need to require masks. Uh, it, we went through some very challenging times until that happened. The fact that Governor Inslee and the team have been responsive and have been assertive and starting early in advance of a problem or an issue, that's what you need. That's what is really what is needed for COVID-19 is to be proactive because if you, if you wait, it's too late and that's the problem. Jim, would you like a follow-up? Uh, yeah, Governor, um, People, uh, the, the, how do you respond to folks in, in the hospitality industry that say that people can't go to restaurants uh, to be with friends, uh, where there are, are certain restrictions already and, and certain cleanliness uh, pr protocols? They're going to go to other people's houses where those protocols aren't in fact aren't in place, and there's going to be bigger sp bigger spread, not smaller spread. Look, what we've done is to uh, reduce the number of interactions in the riskiest categories. And the riskiest categories are when people are breathing on each other across the table with no masks on, in any context. And I have issued uh, uh, executive orders under our emergency authority that effectively uh, uh, it imposes a legal requirement to not do that in any setting right now. Restaurants, homes, cafeterias, coffee shops. We have acted equally in all of those contexts, and that's the best thing we can do. I also believe that this is an important for as, a, as an alarm bell for the community to realize the risk factor that we're in that when restaurants are not open, it is an alarm message to people. And we are hopeful that people will recognize that and act accordingly in their own homes. Now, is every single person going to abide by that? Assuredly not. But I hope and I believe many of them will, and this will reduce the risk dramatically in the state of Washington. And I would point out that these things work. This is not a speculative endeavor. When we did these things, in March, the same thing could have been said. We had to close restaurants in March, and that knocked down the infection rate. So please don't tell me that this doesn't work. 
don't tell me that people are just going to go somewhere else and cause more infection, because that's not what happened in March. We took action in March, and it succeeded. So I guess the best evidence, the proof is in the pudding. We know this works. It has worked. I believe it's going to have some beneficial impact now. Now, what I would also to say to people in the restaurant industry, the pain, the economic and emotional suffering associated with this is profound. Look, a person who starts and puts their life saving in a restaurant and then has to shut it down twice in a year and, and, and lay people off, even, even temporarily, it is a horrible situation for these folks in these, in these businesses, both the owners and the employees. And you can't minimize how, how painful that is. I, I feel it very personally. These are very hard decisions for that reason. I even used to work in the industry. I was a server at Clinker Dagger Bickerstaff and Pets Public House. And uh, I don't want to minimize how tough this is for them, and that is why we are examining every possible way to help them through this. It's why I immediately set, set out $50 million. It's why we're going to continue our efforts to get Congress to work, and we'll continue to look at other ideas on, on how to help the industry. So I don't want to minimize how, how tough this is for folks. Next question comes from Austin with Northwest News Network. I did have a question for the public health officials on the line about the rules around grocery stores and what is the scientific basis for limiting occupancy to 25%, especially when we see other states like Oregon at 75%, and especially when we've been told that as long as we mask up and do our shopping efficiently, um, we're in pretty good shape. And just by announcing this limit, it's, it's created an environment where people are clearing the shelves of toilet paper and other supplies again. Again, I'll, I'll start, and Kathy or Amir can certainly join in. Uh, one of the things, again, that we are looking at is obviously, um, as you said, wearing masks is what we want people to do. Uh, masks aren't 100% effective. Uh, they're great, and they're really, really helping bring down our rates. Uh, but the other things that we consider are time in a place, the number of people who are in a place, the ventilation. And uh, so paying attention to what the science tells us says that we limit our time somewhere, limit the number of people who are there at the same time, keep your distance, you know, cover your face. All of those things together uh, can help us be successful. And it's about putting those things together um, that is so important. And so we've had a limitation on, on um, uh, retail uh, for some time. I think Nick will correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was 30%. Uh, we're bringing it you know, to 25% um, as that additional sort of uh, safety uh, valve there and to bring things in alignment across the system. So um, again, we, you know, all of those things are important from the science and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, and this if, if I can add on a little bit to what Secretary Weisman mentioned, um, and, and this is Nick Struley. Um, so grocery stores and all retail activity have been limited for many months to 30% of their occupancy in every county of the state. And what we heard from many of the larger grocery stores was that at 30% occupancy, they were never in a position where they needed to count individuals coming in because they were never at a place where they were bumping up against that 30% occupancy. So that's why we felt bringing this equity, bringing everybody in line in retail, whether that's small or large, to 25% was another tool to help address this issue. Austin, would you like to ask a follow-up? Uh, yes, briefly, Governor, you're making an appointment today, but you have been mentioned numerous times in the last few days as a potential pick for the new Biden administration. Three quick questions. Have you been contacted by the president-elect or his transition team? Are you being vetted? And if asked to join that administration, what would be your answer? Uh, no, no, and my answer remains the same, no matter how many times you ask it, <laughs> with all due respect. By the way, going back to this issue of hoarding in our 25 percent, I do think it, it would have been probably beneficial if the public knew that it was such a modest change. Uh, that would have been a beneficial situation. Uh, maybe some of that's on us. Maybe we could have made that more clear. Maybe the media could have made it more clear. But what is clear now is that the supply chain is very robust. 
There is no reason for hoarding, and I hope the folks, uh, you know, in our media industry can share that with people as much as you can. This has not changed your ability to get paper products or food really in any, in any way whatsoever. We have time for one more question. We go to Jerry with the Everett Herald. Uh, maybe I want to follow up on um, the question that Austin asked to the public health officials using that science about limiting uh, the time spent in place, the number of people as it related to retail stores. Did you um, apply the same science to the court system? And if so, how did you come to the conclusion that courts could continue to have jury trials and in-person proceedings in which individuals are in a one space for hours at a time. So again, I think the court system uh, has uh, procedures in place where we are actually uh, giving them the guidance around uh, wearing the face coverings, keeping distance, uh, sanitizing, and the things that we think are important for that. You know, the law, I believe, allows for, um, you know, folks to have jury trials. That's part of the due process. Uh, and we are doing our best to make sure that the system can continue to move forward as safely as it can and uh, working with the justice system uh, so they have all the information they need uh, to be able to carry on their duties as safely as they can. I may note that in neither case uh are these restrictions prohibiting the activity? Jury trials will allow to go forward and shopping are, is allowed to go forward. It's just in a safe way. Jerry, would you like to ask a follow-up? If for the governor, I want to be talking about um, the budget situation and the Federal CARES Act funding. Several counties are bumping up against that December 30th deadline to allocate money and are leaving potentially tens of millions of dollars unspent going into the new year. The state, I think, is around 300 million, according to some lawmakers. So will the state be able to allocate its full Federal CARES Act, or and if not, what's the plan to protect those dollars heading into January? Uh, yes, we'll be able to do that. And I think so far uh, our, decision, our pace of decision-making has worked quite well. We reserved a, a, enough to deal with unanticipated expenditures, including the third wave. So instead of spending all the money in the first few months, we reserved some, realizing some things could come up. And indeed, they came up. The third wave came up. So that's why we're in a position to do the $50 million now uh, and, and, and deal with some of the, the other issues that are, are now striking us. So I'm confident we'll be able to use these resources, and we're doing it, uh, and I think, a way that has been pretty much vindicated in, in this situation. Any final words, Governor? No, again, uh, uh, please be careful. Please, please take care of yourself. And I just want to note that we can take care of ourselves. This is a temporary situation we're going through. We have the ability to control this virus. This virus has no legs. It can't move at all. We are the only agents that can spread this virus. And we don't want to be a friend of this virus. At Thanksgiving dinner, we don't want to be a friend of this virus. At birthday parties, we don't want to be a friend of this virus. Uh, at coffee clashes, we do not want to be friends of this virus. We should be enemies of this virus. And the way to be enemy of this virus is to is to you know, not be around people without wearing a mask in our homes or anywhere else. And I'm urgently asking people to consider this. If we do this, we can get through this without large loss of life. If we do this, we can get through this without people not being able to get necessary surgery because our ICUs are full. If we do these things, we won't have people in the parking lots of hospitals and the morgue having to rent semi-trucks and ice for our, our lost loved ones. If we do not do these things, that's the situation that we face. So if you do note urgency in my voice, it's because it's, it's the reality that we face. And I hope everybody can pull together in that regard. Thank you very much.